in our series. This is the fifth one. And today we're having two great speakers with us. And our topic is academic class centers and the core challenges, learner and teacher relationships in this era of the COVID pandemic. And I have two distinguished guests and I wanna thank them for being with us this morning and this afternoon actually. And we will start with Professor Stephen Cantor, who is from the United States. He serves as the president and the CEO of the Association of Academic Health Centers and uh, the original one and the international one. And from 2014 to 2018, he had served as the Dean of University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine, where he was a professor of biomedical and health informatics, and he held the chair in medicine. And I leave the floor to him now, and I'm looking forward to hear to his talk. Thank you. Oh, by the way, we're going to have the questions at the end of the meeting. Please use the chat box or uh, the question uh, where is available. I'll forward all your questions to our speakers at the end. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, and greetings to everyone. I'm really delighted to spend time with you and talk about the importance of academic health centers and, and how joining together as an academic health center can lead to new and valuable advances in healthcare. Uh, it's wonderful to be here and uh, thank you, Rector, uh, Dr. Rameza Kansaviolo, and thank you for your invitation to give this talk and warm greetings to uh, other distinguished guests. And uh, a thank you to Professor Albert Sherpier uh, for being here to share your expertise. Uh, I also want to recognize your university for its leadership in the region and for its high level of engagement internationally and with the Association of Academic Health Centers. We really value your partnership and it's wonderful to uh, be a part of this meeting. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about why universities and hospitals join together. Um, can we get my slides? Thank you, Habiba. I'd like to talk for just a few minutes about why universities and hospitals uh, join together to form academic health centers. Uh, next slide, please. Academic health centers are defined a little bit differently in different countries around the world, uh, but in general, an academic health center includes a school of medicine, which is often described as the anchor of the academic health center. Uh, it also includes a main teaching hospital, sometimes more than one, usually located on the same campus or nearby. Uh, it often includes a research enterprise uh, and other health profession schools like nursing, dentistry, pharmacy, and, and so on. And the nature of the relationships among these entities varies. Sometimes a university owns the medical school and the hospital. Uh, sometimes neither owns the other, but there are well-written affiliation agreements that define how they will work together. And sometimes there are a variety of other uh, relationships depending on uh, where you are in the world and what the uh, issues are with that uh, country. As an academic health center grows and forms strong relationships with hospitals that are not part of the center and with community health systems and other entities, uh, it often becomes called an academic health system in some places. Uh, and some places even use the term academic health network. The important point is, regardless of how the relationship is structured, regardless of who owns whom, hospitals and medical schools want to build strong relationships because it's these relationships that lead to better doctors better scientists, better patient outcomes, and even to the development of new drugs and devices, new companies and economic growth for a region. Uh, next slide, please. So which image best depicts your institution? Uh, is it based on silos that don't really communicate well with each other, like the image labeled A, or is it based on well-formed interlocking relationships among the various units, like the image labeled B? 
Uh, it's hard work to move from A to B and every academic health center strives to move from A to B. And of course the rewards are very uh, valuable. Next slide, please. Alignment of an academic health center is the degree to which the component parts work cohesively, work together effectively. Full alignment allows academic health centers to act quickly and, and cohesively toward common goals. Uh, our AIM program, which we're, we can give you more information about, is designed to help institutions achieve better alignment. I listed a reference at the bottom of the page that's a great example of how alignment leads to improved outcomes. Next slide, please. So, so here are 10 reasons why it's valuable to develop academic health centers. And these, of course, are the core challenges for an academic health center. Uh, number one, to stimulate economic growth. Number two, it attracts new talent to the region. The better you are, the better the talent you attract. Uh, it helps move discoveries to the marketplace, helps create jobs locally. It reinforces the complementary roles of research and teaching uh, and catalyzes intellectual cross-fertilization, which leads to innovation, which leads to economic growth. Uh, academic health centers support the kind of risk-taking that leads to the generation of new ideas, which is so important for progress. Uh, they help cultivate individual potential uh, and they can develop trusted health tourism destinations. Uh, and ultimately they establish a culture of excellence at the nexus of health, education and science. Next slide, please. I wanna mention just a few emerging issues that uh, we're, we're hearing more and more about from uh, our members and from leaders of academic health centers around the world. Cybersecurity concerns are uh, occurring more and more and academic health centers are putting in place mechanisms to deal with that. We're also hearing about new leadership roles at academic health centers. Uh, several places are appointing chief innovation officers to really focus on new ideas and how to drive them forward. Uh, we're even hearing about uh, appointment of a chief medical social media officer, uh, which is uh, focused on the disinformation in medicine and making sure that social media uh, for a particular institution is, is representing evidence-based uh, advice and information about healthcare. Um, we're hearing uh, a lot about whose responsibility is it to address social determinants of health and how do we pay for that work. Uh, we're hearing a lot about challenges in using health analytics at academic health centers and, and how that can impact population health initiatives. Uh, of course, we're hearing about artificial intelligence and predictive modeling, some about climate change and how it may impact the epidemiology of disease, and even how that may uh, impact uh, what kinds of future pandemics we have to deal with. We're also hearing interesting ideas about designing new buildings that can, can uh, continue to operate during a pandemic. Uh, for example, how do you design a new hospital so you can continue to do elective surgeries even during a pandemic? How do you design a new medical school building so that you can continue in-person classes even during an emergency or a pandemic? Next slide, please. So I want to uh, shift gears for just a minute and um, maybe have a little bit of fun asking the question, uh, what can we learn from the field of ecology? Uh, so in the field of ecology, there is a concept called ecotones and uh, ecotones are places where two different ecosystems meet and integrate. It's a place of, of transition, so it might be uh, the place where a forest meets a meadow, 
or uh, the place where a rainforest uh, meets uh, a marine environment. Um, and, and it's in these uh, ecotones uh, where you see a lot of transition. And, and in fact, if you look carefully in an ecotone, you see a lot of diversity of plant life and animal life, a lot of dynamic activity, uh, even new and exotic species that will exist in an ecotone that don't exist in either ecosystem on either side of the ecotone. So the question for us, uh, next slide, please. The question for us is, where are the ecotones in an academic health center? Um, are there interesting ecotones between medicine and nursing, between basic science and clinical care? Uh, are there ecotones between primary care and specialty care, um, academia and industry, evidence and tradition? And of course, uh, teaching and learning, which you'll hear more about in a minute. And so I would ask the question, how often do we see barriers between these areas instead of ecotones that are rich with possibilities? Next slide, please. So ecotones can be easy to see or they can be difficult to recognize. And on many of my slides, I've had uh, this image that appears on the right side of this slide. Um, and, and this represents a picture of an ecotone. You can see if you look uh, very carefully, next slide, please. If you look carefully, uh, the area above the green shaded rectangle has mainly conifer trees. The area below the green shaded rectangle has mainly hardwoods and there's an area of transition in between. And that area of transition is where there's a lot of activity. There, there are different species coming together in new ways. There's innovation and change and opportunity. Um, and so I would, I would uh, end by saying there are areas of change uh, all around us. We just need to look for them. And if we find them, we can do even greater things together. So uh, think about the ecotones in your institution in, in academic medicine. And thank you again for the opportunity to visit with you. And thank you especially for your partnership. I look forward to working with you in new and exciting ways. And thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Carter. Now I will switch gear to Professor Albert Sharpier. Um, he's a professor of quality pr uh, promotion and medical education, and he was the dean of the Faculty of Health, Medicine, and Life Sciences, and vice chair of Maastricht University Medical Center uh, since last June. But he's very much interested, and I guess he's going to talk about some of the ecotones that Professor Carter was talking about, and this is about learner and teacher relationship in academic centers. Thank you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and really thank you for the invitation. I um, would love to have come to Istanbul, but this is a, a quite good alternative. Uh, and maybe later we can do that uh, live. Um, I will share my screen with you. Yeah, I'm talking about learner-teacher relationships. And um, if you look to education, uh, in the old days, this was the main issue in education, but still in many schools, uh, there's something similar, um, which is a little bit strange because we know much more about how education works. Uh, we thought that uh, having a teacher who has the information uh, will bring the information to the learners uh, and that the learners will automatically learn from the teacher. That is the assumption that teaching is learning. While we know that teaching is not learning, teaching can be learning, 
but it's not always the same. And there is a, an interesting uh, study a long time ago where you look uh, how, how many people remember things from a lecture, it's mainly 5%. There's of course variation. And I think we know all from our own background that you had very good lectures and more bad lectures. But the more you let people do yourself, uh, themselves, then they are learning more. And the most you learn is when you teach other people. And I think most of us know that by experience also. So I would say in the early 2000s, uh, we really know that proactive learners who do things on themselves learn much more and learn better than people who sit at the feet and waiting at the reactive learners. The proactive learners enter into learning much more purposeful and with greater motivation. They tend to retain and make use of what they learn much better and longer than do the reactive learners. So nowadays we are, or have been entering into a very strange new world, in which rapid changes will be the only stable factor. So there is more reason, more reason to think about education. It's not longer realistic to define the purpose of education as transmitting what is known, because what is known is a very short time period. The half life time of many facts and skills maybe 10 years or less, half of what a person has acquired at the age of 20 may be obsolete by the time that the person is 30. So we have to rethink the whole continuum. The main purpose of education nowadays must be to develop the skills of inquiry. And what we know from all these years, there are three important things. Um, teaching should be constructive, contextual and collaborative. Um, constructive is that you build on early, earlier knowledge. <clears throat> contextual is that you bring things in the context that people have to use it. That's based on experiments where they learn dive or something underwater. And these divers were not able to reproduce it when they were out of the water. So what we remember has to do with context. And I think most of the clinicians remember that because if you ask clinicians, they remember patients, uh, they even remember their smell, their color, everything, because it's stored in context. And that's important for our teaching. Collaborative, uh, I think that's the only way forward. We have to work together uh, as students, as teachers, as professors, as institutions, because that's the future. There are many models, doesn't matter that much which model you choose. These are the basic components that are important. So there are many new roles for staff. Uh, of course, you can be tutor in a small group. You can be expert for lectures, panels, or assignments. You can be a coordinator or a member. You can be teacher, supervisor, and practical medical trainer, examiner. And nowadays, learning how to teach on distance, which is a really new feature since the pandemic and has Bring, brought many good things, I think, uh, so that we can make on later on choices, what we will do on campus, what we will do on distance. So that's a new balance we will find and a good balance, I think. Now, I would like to go with you a little bit further in the future. Uh, I think when we think about the future, you should not only talk about undergraduate or postgraduate programs, you should think about the whole continuum. Because most of the young people will have to work 40 years after their initial training. That's a rather long period. And I think most of our institutes are not th thinking that good about that period because it's a very important period. And certainly because the environment is changing so fast. Um, so learning in these, 40 years will be much more important in the future. Who should work and think at new programs? Um, in my belief, not only senior staff, but also people from other disciplines, uh, from the health system, and not to forget patients. Um, also young people, like students. If you want to think and talk about IT, you should not ask me, because I don't know. Um, but our young people do. Um, 
and also people that know the evidence about different approaches in and outside medical education, for example, about change management. So I think really what Dr. Kantor already mentioned, we are now in a time that we should work together. With different disciplines, we really can make big steps forward. What you can say about the education approach, yeah, of course, it will be small groups often, uh, self-directed, uh, what I call not page-based, uh, like you still see in some schools. You have to learn page one till 30, and that's it. That's not the way forward, I think. Communication and other skills are much more important nowadays, general competencies, and so on. Many people talk about a global curriculum. I don't think that's a smart idea. I think you should take your own culture into account because your own culture is important. Um, that doesn't mean that you should not think global. Of course, you should think global, but don't forget your own culture because that's an important value. I think for the future, if possible, we should not do only digital or distance. We, look, we also need to work on campus, certainly in the undergraduate programs. I think it can be different postgraduate and later on there you can do much more on distance. The consequences is that we have to start working in networks and many of you do already and uh, I fully support the idea of Dr. Kanter about the eco tone. And I have seen many of these things in my own faculty uh, because we are originally emerged from a faculty of uh, health with the faculty of medicine. And uh, <clears throat> it took around 10 years to bring them completely together. And, uh, and we, when we started with this process, also together with the hospital, most of the clinicians couldn't spell the word prevention. And nowadays they're talking always about prevention. And nowadays the, the mission of uh, our hospital is that we should, that we have a task to avoid and to prevent that people come into the hospital. So we have a task also outside the, the hospital. And I think this eco tone uh, is really very important and can bring you so much. Uh, so I'm really a believer uh, and a supporter of this idea. Um, I think these meetings are very important to change, exchange ideas because we can learn so much from each other. Uh, although we live in different cultures and situations, the big issues are usually the same and we can learn from each other approaches and solution. Uh, so I think that's a very good thing. The staff, because that was an important thing. Um, I think the staff should be able to adapt to changes because in their future career, changes will come faster than ever. It means also we should pay much more attention on flexible careers, not, not only a research career, um, Staff needs to get feedback, uh, so that should be organized. And we need also for staff, we need to organize possibilities to learn. And um, I think it's very important for staff to visit other institutions to learn how things uh, go in other situations. And for example, in my own faculty, we had a lot of programs abroad to, to help uh, in low income countries to improve education. And uh, in my view, it was an important teacher role to help there and do some of this work because it really opens your eyes uh, if you have been elsewhere and see that your own situation is not that bad uh, because then you can compare. And uh, so then thank to the students uh, in my career because the students are very important. Uh, because they really know what's happening in the program. Most of the teachers knows only parts of the program, but the students know it all. So the interaction between students and teachers is really very important. And, um, and I think it's very great fun uh, to work closely with students. And certainly now we have that new roles that we can coach students and help students. That's very rewarding. And um, in my beginning of our career, I planned to become a doctor. But then I went into education and, and I see students really as my partners, uh, which give me fantastic feedback and I learn so much from them. And they are the future, uh, though they need to be involved in new plans because they know what's happening. Thank you very much.
Thank you, sir, uh, for interesting uh, talk. And now um, I will forward you some of the questions. I actually took some notes. And, and, uh, I will start with Stephen, if you let me. And you talked about this very interesting topic, the ecotone. So uh, could you just share some um, situations? You actually gave examples like getting together with the nurses and the uh, medical school or pharmacy and the other school and the um, industry and the academic center. So any concrete uh, examples for those ecotones or uh, kind of clues to how to move forward through this ecotone to make it like the big uh, ecosystem? Yes, thank you. That's a very interesting question. So um, uh, several years ago, when we were uh, designing a curriculum, a medical educate medical school curriculum, uh, we had basic science courses, and we had clinical clerkships. Mm. And the tendency was the, we created a, a course design group for each course. So, you know, the pathology course had a design group of maybe six or seven people and the nephrology course had a design group and the pulmonary course. And the tendency was if it was basic science, if it was the immunology course, the design group would be six or seven basic scientists. And if it was the nephrology course, it was all the kidney doctors, right? And so what we started to do was we, we mixed it up a little bit. For the immunology course, we put a nephrologist on that design group and we put a pulmonologist, we purposely mixed basic scientists and clinicians. And then when we turned to the clinical years, they said, well, for the clinical years, you wouldn't put a basic scientist on the group, but we did. And what we found was it led to new ideas mm -hmm. that people hadn't thought of before. And it even after the meetings, people started to talk and it even led to new ideas for new new research grants. And so new research proposals came out of it. So it was a very interesting way. And if we hadn't had thought about ecotones and the barriers that exist, you know, we wouldn't have been able to do that. I'm sorry for the background noise. They're doing construction outside my house. And so I can't. We're recall. not hearing anything. Don't worry about okay. it. Okay. <laughs> so, but yes, that's a, I thought was a very interesting example. Another um, another way to approach this issue of ecotones, which many of us have done, is to build a bridge between two buildings. And as people walk back and forth, they meet and talk and new ideas form. And just by building a bridge between two buildings, you can uh, change the culture and change how people think. So those are a couple of examples. Okay, great. But then you have to have a big campus and lots of, you know, main buildings to build these bridges. If you have one big, you know, hospital in the campus, so it's a little bit harder than to do that. Anyway, but actually, uh, Professor Albert also gave an example of this uh, new idea, or maybe it's not new, it's new for me, and I liked it a lot. And he was talking about bringing the health uh, faculty or health sciences faculty with the medical school. So how did it move forward? It's still, uh, um, it's not possible with our regulations, national regulations to come up one school, but how did it move forward? And what was uh, the big outcome of this combination getting together yeah. health sciences and medical school together actually? Yeah, yeah, we, we were able to, to do it, but, but then still you need a lot of time because you bring in two cultures together. Uh, and I think what you see now uh, is that uh, it's completely mixed, uh, completely integrated. And after that, we made the step to integrate also with the hospital. And, uh, and I think that really brought many new ideas and, and also 
the fact that, for example, what I told you that now in the mission of the hospital is the statement that we have a task outside the hospital. That never would have been happened if we had not the health sciences on board, because these people know how to do that. And um, But you need to take your time because uh, these people talk different languages. So you really need time. And um, there were also periods in which we stimulated um, collaborations by giving some grants for people who had a, an idea with, with brought different disciplines together. Uh, these people get some money and other people who didn't do it didn't get the money. So these kind of things. Um, we, have been, have, we had a nice idea about innovation circles. So we are, um, every uh, research group uh, in a certain topic uh, had to find out where they are in the innovation circle and how they could make the circle round with, with collaborations. Um, and that was based on the idea that, that more and more, I think universities and academic hospitals have to bring results to the market. Um, but some of our more fundamental scientists are not thinking that way. And we wanted to bring them and connect them with other people that also their ideas had to go to the market, to the patient and to the citizens. Uh, so. I think different techniques on different moments. And, and, uh, and I think you need the capacity of a marathon loper. So you need really long, uh, long time because it takes time. Sure, indeed. And another question is about, actually I will direct it to both of you. What about the online teaching and out of campus uh, learning facilities or abilities rather? Yeah. Of, uh, are medical students or health science students at the uh, pandemic era, the COVID-19 uh, period? Your experiences and future proje projections. This is like 10 questions, actually. Yeah. Uh, one. yeah. You want me to go, Albert? All right. So... Um, uh, you know, I think we're at the very beginning of understanding what we what is most effective to do online and what's more effective to do in person. You know, um, a year, say a year and a half ago, if I had proposed that you do 60 percent of your teaching online, the question I think people would have asked is, well, what is the added value of doing it online? And, and I, you would have put me on the spot. What is the added value? I would have had to answer that, right? Now, everything is flipped. Now that we see what we can do online, if I say you really need to bring everybody back in person, people are saying, what's the added value of doing it in person? So those are very interesting questions that I think we all need to wrestle with and understand the added value on both sides. And I think we're just at the beginning of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I agree. I think the pandemic brought a revolution in that respect, uh, which had very good aspects. And uh, because I think there are many things that we can do online. On the other hand, uh, we are very worried about the social life of the students. I think many of us are, and uh, because they are at an age that they need social contact. Uh, they need also their freedom because that's a period in your life that you usually have most freedom. Uh, you can do things that they can't do. So, so that's, that's really a worry. And um, I think we, we are discussing with the government that we need some more time on campus, uh, of course, safe, good regulated and so on, because for the well-being of the students and uh, mainly. And um, so I think we, we can learn a lot for the future um, because if, um, when we first start with the idea of lectures online, many teachers said, you're crazy, you are not gonna do that, it uh, doesn't work and so on. And now, we had to, so, so that's good. Uh, and I think we need a lot of uh, talks and discussion and exchange of experience to find the right balance. And uh, so I think that's really an important topic for one of the future meetings, how to find that balance in a good way. And um, 
I'm myself, for example, also involved uh, in a medical school who does um, have really early practical experience in hospitals and the rest is digital. And um, so I'm, I'm involved because I want to find out how is this balance working? And um, for many parts of the world, this would be a great solution. So I think also outside uh, our countries and in other countries in Africa or Asia, I think there are so, the need of trained doctors is so huge. So if we can find other ways how to do that, then we can solve issues. So uh, it's a very interesting period. Not easy, but interesting, yeah. <laughs> Totally agree, Albert. Thank you. And uh, to add upon your uh, opinion about making your curriculum in accordance with your culture and the need of your community is critical. While you were touching about the Asian and the African medical education and the need of professionals, healthcare professionals, not only physicians, but nurses or all, all other healthcare providers, it's important. But the Type of education given there just is totally different than what we are used to, depending on their resources and their culture as well. And that's a difference. So the other question I was wondering about in the COVID area, how would you let or not let the students get into contact with the real patients? I mean, what we do is you know, we have the COVID you know, inpatient clinics, wards, dedicated to those uh, patients. Yeah. And we don't allow anyone uh, yeah. with proper education to be in that clinic, but we, we still want to continue with our six-year students who are actually the COVID interns. They don't have any lectures. It's all hands-on uh, year or like a JHO in the UK. And so um, any suggestions or any uh, ways that you do it in your countries or in your schools? Stephen? Um, yes, I don't have um, uh, I, I don't have a lot to add in that realm. Um, um, I, I'm wondering if uh, Albert, are you, are you familiar with what's happening? I'm not familiar in that area what's happening. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I am. Uh, in the beginning, um, we stopped with clerkships. Uh, because we had to find out uh, how we can combine COVID with, with normal patient care and so on. Later on, we involved the students in COVID care and also uh, we, they helped us to organize other things in normal patient care. And, um, and we thought, well, you learn so much in that situation. That has the same value as a clerkship and maybe you even learn more. Uh, now there is a small organization organized by students um, where they make a mix between wishes from the hospital for help with students. Um, and they connect the right person to the, to the right question. And so now it's working out pretty well. And, um, and for the students, it was, a, it was fantastic to do because they really felt that they had an important role. And um, so there we find the, the right balance, yeah. Right, great, that's really nice. But um, on the other hand, I was also th thinking about, yes, we're talking about uh, meeting our patients in face-to-face -face in real time, not the virtual or simulated patients, etc. But looking at how we provide our healthcare by the use of remote patient controlling or telemedicine or telehealth. So uh, preparing our students for the digital world is yeah. going to be another task for, for us, I guess. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, we had one of the periods, uh, most of our outpatient clinics uh, went over to, to uh, conference calls and so on. So the patients didn't need to come to the hospital, which was a great experience for the students because they were involved in these calls. And uh, I think these things will stay in a while because uh, in the past, many patients traveled a lot of time uh, and the same could be done in a conference call uh, so that will also bring change in healthcare approaches so i think uh, telemedicine also made huge steps forward uh, while in the earlier days there were a lot of non-believers now they see it works and uh, so 
also in healthcare, it will lead to, to changes of attitude and changes of approaches. Yeah, and that's good, I think. Yeah, I think about, well, at least in, on our side, we will need more regulations to make sure that we don't violate any patient safety or uh, privacy issues, that's an issue. And also it comes to health economics, everything depends on the reimbursement. And so now we're gonna reimburse all those scheduled uh, outpatient meetings or uh, to seeing the patients or having the outpatient follow-ups. Anyway, yeah. the, uh, I would like to forward another question to you that's probably gonna be the last one. And actually this is also interesting that Stephen touched upon the social media officer in the hospital to make sure that we disinform, no, we correct the disinformation related to healthcare or education or anything, vaccination and things like that. Um, would you suggest just hiring someone dedicated to that? Because I will not be the one definitely running the social media. <laughs> to that too. Uh, it's very critical and um, you have to wear it thoughtful. So. Any suggestions for that? Um, I, I think sometimes uh, there's uh, already someone on your team, uh, usually someone who is uh, more junior and, and not a senior person who uh, really understands the social media world and has some new and interesting ideas about how to think about information and disinformation in, in healthcare. You know, we've dealt with those issues for a long time with the anti-vaccination movements and other things, you know, uh, but with the speed uh, and influence of social media, you know, having uh, somebody think about how you communicate those things in the current world is interesting. So I don't know if you have to bring in somebody new, uh, but, but a medical person who, um, is junior and, and interested and motivated could be really helpful. True. Now I have received a question, uh, interesting question, a good question. Well, you know that every country has a kind of an exam or evaluation system to uh, recruit our students or graduates to the residency programs or fellowships programs. And do you believe that it has to change after this online teaching program? I know that in the States, there is a change in the US enemies as pass or fail, not grading. And there is a big discussion about it. And there was actually a uh, New England paper about that issue uh, two months ago, I guess. And so any suggestions for how to move forward for recruiting our uh, younger graduates to the residency program? Even you want? Uh, I'll let you go first, Albert. Okay, okay. Now, I, I think you really have to think uh, and look for the evidence if you are able to select on assessment. Uh, because that kind of selection is not so easy. And um, the other issue I always have is that we need so many different doctors. Um, there is not one type of doctor we want to select. That's impossible. Uh, because if you only look in a group of surgeons, uh, a gastrointestinal surgeon is a completely different person as a trauma surgeon. Uh, so I don't believe that much, and I don't, also don't see the evidence that, that you are able to do that. <clears throat> and I think more and more, even in the future, you, you need teams but different people who, who uh, are complementary to each other, who have different styles, competencies, and so on, but together they are something very good. And then you need fast people, slow people, thinkers, doers, and so on. So um, I'm a bit um, skeptical about it, so to say. <laughs> and Stephen, you? Um, I, I think that covers it. I don't have uh, too much to add to that, but yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, good answer, yeah. Albert. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, that was a great answer. Indeed, we need to have different uh, physicians with different characteristics dedicated to different aspects of healthcare providers or research or education. And it's yeah. not, you know, 
one exam answers all or one system answers all. It has to um, move forward as well. Yeah. And anyway, let me just check, check, uh, check my chat box. I don't see, I don't see any more questions. So I will thank you both. Uh, for being with us this morning and this afternoon. I know you have a busy schedule and I hope to meet you in Istanbul in person. Uh, very much looking forward to that. Until then, uh, stay safe and well. And thank you very much again. Bye. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Stay safe and well. Thank you. you do. Yeah, thank you Bye. very much. Beautiful. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.